Welcome to Cut to the Chase with Rob Chase. Brought to you by the InlandNorthwestReport.com. Alternative news and opinion for the Inland Northwest. And now, here's your host, Rob Chase. Hi, this is Rob Chase with Cutting to the Chase. Brought to you by the InlandNorthwestReport.com, an alternative news and opinion site for the Inland Northwest. Today, our guest is uh, Sharon Hannock, also known as Research Mom. So let's uh, cut right to the chase. And Sharon, tell us who Research Mom is. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me on your show, Rob. And I enjoyed coming back to Spokane and, and talking to your audiences here, as well as all across Washington State. Research Mom got started because I was a mom that got interested in what's happening to education issues in Washington State started researching, finding out what was going on, and then finding out the bad things going on, and started talking to our legislators. I would go down to Olympia and say, hey, did you know that this bill number 1234 is going to affect math education, and here's what the books will look like. So as I started to talk to our, le our leaders about education issues and providing them with documents of what it would look like, they just started saying, here comes that mom that brings in the research. Hence, I coined the phrase re research mom, and I've been going around for the past 15 years, talking to legislators in Olympia, testifying on bills, and uh, being there about once or twice a week because I live on the Tacoma area, the other side of the mountains here. Why was education your bailiwick? Why is education so important to you? Education is important primarily because I became a mom. I think like every mom and dad out there, you want the best for your child. And so I started kind of connecting with some of the other moms and dads that were homeschooling. Okay, well, I agree with you. Education is important. So important that uh, the federal government kind of got into education. I think during the Carter administration, was that a good idea? I think the federal government should stay out of education completely. Um, that it should really be a state's issue, and there are going to be states that do it right, and states that, in my opinion, do it wrong, like Washington State has. Mm -hmm. Well, what has Washington State done? I've seen there's different programs, and No Child Left Behind, and Common Core, and probably a couple of different, but you've been involved this a long time. What is sort of the history of it in Washington State? Well, is that when Goals 2000 was passed, it changed the paradigm on what your focus is for educating a child. Most people think that the focus should be teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, and the basic essential skills on, on how to think through a math formula or a, a sentence structure. Mm -hmm. But with the advent <clears throat> of the standards-based education, also known as performance-based education, it changed the paradigm where the focus is about the process of thinking, not the actual little units of thinking. Hence, now we fast forward from 1990s to where we are today in 2019. Um, what we have is an education system that's focused on making sure that all kids think correctly, that all kids have the right ability to, um, to be, part of it is be happy, and to be productive. So our state of Washington laws on defining what is basic education is to make a productive and satisfying student. Do you think uh, more than reading, writing, and arithmetic, the, the goal is uniformity? Um, the uniformity or, or just, it's, if it's uniform, it's uniformity of outcomes. So mm -hmm. that every child has the correct outcome of how they think and how they process information. But that's why you see in math classes now that you no longer focus on the correct answer in math. You focus on how you got the correct answer to the point that there are children that are saying 2 plus 2 is 5 and having a really great explanation for it and getting an A on their assignment. In a way, though, that destroys your thinking process because no longer are children taught to think linearly. No longer do they have the concept of an absolute outcome, an answer. And therefore, it is hard for them to understand what is right and wrong, what is truth and lies. Their entire mindset is being trained to think in a gray area. Mm -hmm. So it's whatever they decide it is. Correct. Correct. And a lot of times what it ends up being with is peer pressure. So what's more important is what your group thinks it should be, not what the actual correct answer is. Mm -hmm. It's not about doing the right thing anymore. It's about doing what the group's opinion is. So you need to do the right thing rather than the easy thing. Uh, e e easy thing or just what the collective thinks. And therefore, you, have, uh, you make products such as AOC. Right. Who, who no longer thinks logically 
In fact, in Olympia, <clears throat> one senator said to me, we don't think in terms of truth and logic. You have to get more guys on your side than they have on theirs. It's one of the reasons why I do go around the state and I talk about education issues. I talk about how to research laws, how to testify, how to be an activist. Is because I'm trying to get more guys on my side than they have on theirs. Well, there's some hope there. I've met a lot of uh, young, intelligent kids, uh, but they're mostly homeschooled. <laughs> From what I, I've seen, uh, what percentage of uh, do our students go through public school? And still, I'd say you still have one. Is it over ninety percent? Um, I would say a lot of children still go through the public school. That is the majority of the system. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the private schools and the homeschoolings. Both are growing industries, mm -hmm. but I don't know exa the exact numbers. Um, Ooh, yeah. Well, you know, Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex, but it seems like we've got the educational industrial complex, this factory I, too. I, I do mm -hmm. believe that because of the way that the system of teaching and with the advent of Common Core, it even brought more uniformity to how a child is processing information, the outcomes of how they think, mm -hmm. rather than the focus of the inputs. And it also then takes away the individuality of a child. Yeah. Well, I think there's always kind of been some indoctrination. I went to parochial school. So mm -hmm. child, we all wore the same uniforms and uh, so mm -hmm. we were uniformly like that. We were all taught the the same things. We learned by rote. You know, I think I learned two plus two equals four before I even really thought about it. You right. know? And sometimes you just have to memorize and remember things before you understand really <clears throat> why you do that. Um, also, I believe that parents have the right to, I guess you might call it indoctrinate their children to their mm -hmm. value systems such as religion and culture. Right. And so that is not, it's not a bad thing, and really, each unique family. You know, if you are a faith-based family, you want to bring your child up a certain way. Well, I think every child goes through that questioning period naturally anyway, and then mm -hmm. they've got to, well, is this true or not, but I've been taught, you know, and then they kind of have to prove it to themselves, and then right. some veer off from their parents' direction, as long as there's freedom, and then some actually, well, actually, these, right. these were ancient values, you know, have always mm -hmm. worked, so they... They do work as a good way to live your and life. One, as they say, common ground, there is such thing as truth, and there is such thing as absolute truth. And mm -hmm. even if you stray from your parents' values, oftentimes, if there's truth to that, you will come back to it. Mm -hmm. And I also find, though, that in public schools, sometimes the teachers are telling the kids, you have the right to your own value system apart from your parents. Mm -hmm. That is then pushing the child even further away from the parents because it's validating their choice to stray. And it's and also I've seen essay questions. Parents have shown me. They have to write an essay, a persuasive essay and persuading your parents to do to let you do something you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so now they're using that expression and using language arts class to convince the parents otherwise and so their whole thought process is on defying mom and dad. Now I think you believe in the importance of math, whereas I hated math. As a, I didn't yeah, didn't understand, you know, well, I could, I could, okay, A plus 2 equals 4, then you could solve for A. Um, but once it became all letters and no numbers, I thought, what bearing would this ever have on my life? But yet they pushed the STEM thing, I think science, technology, engineering and math, uh, engineering and math thing. Uh, but I think maybe to the detriment of the humanities, uh, well, a well-rounded education first, like we get. You know, when, when you say you didn't like math and there are people that didn't like math or they never got the right answer, mm -hmm. but the concept that your mom wouldn't let you watch TV, your teacher held you back from recess because you were trying to do the problem to the correct answer over and over and over again, mm -hmm. that creates something called repetition. It creates, it kind of gels the synapses in your brain Correct. to a certain pathway because you're trying to get to this right answer. And it makes you then think through to a logical conclusion, and it creates a characteristic trait called perseverance mm -hmm. and discipline. Yeah. So once you go through that and that training of the mind, so I believe math trains the mind to be disciplined and to have that repetition for perseverance. Mm -hmm. If your math class is 2 plus 2 is 5, and I've got a great explanation and I'm done, then how do you ever develop the trait called perseverance? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing a lot of times is this trait of doing it over and over, the stick to itness, commitment. We're seeing that being lost in future generations. And I sometimes wonder, is it because they're not forced to go down that route in class? 
they're forced to try it one way, create a great explanation for that one way, and call it good. But can't you do that also with other subjects like uh, geography or history? <clears throat> I, you know, some of the kids that were good at math, they would do the extra credit. <laughs> Things yes. in the back of the yes. book, and um, if they're really into it, you know, they would, they love doing math at home. But, you know, I, I would go home and I, uh, I would read encyclopedias about history or mm -hmm. geography because that was what I was. So I sort of had that discipline because that's who I wanted to be. I knew I would but, never be an engineer or a mathematician. And then when you learn history, you actually had a discipline because it's a process <clears throat> of learning history in chronological order. Well, yes. It's learning history in its context of uh -huh. historical. Now, what I see in history books is we're going to study the uh, Civil War. Mm -hmm. What would you feel like if you were a slave? Mm -hmm. What would you feel like if you oh. were a slave owner? So now you're bringing in your experiential experiences, of which you may have none, mm -hmm. but you're now bringing that to the table. And so I've even watched things like reading of Shakespeare. You know, did you ever like a guy that you couldn't have because your parents didn't like him? What did that feel like? So mm -hmm. you're not studying the actual words of Shakespeare or the meaning and the intent of what the author is trying to tell you. You're bringing your own world into it. One of the, the history books that I've seen is a social studies say, a study on pilgrims. Mm -hmm. and the first thing you do is the pre-reading skill. What do you already know about pilgrims? What do you want to learn about pilgrims? There's five questions of things you want to learn about pilgrims. Then when you finish reading the chapter on pilgrims, the first answer, the first question you go to is, did I get my answers? You know, I had five questions about pilgrims. Did this passage answer it? So what it does is it trains the mind to be picking and choosing what they want to learn about pilgrims. They're not just like what you were doing, is studying the author. You know, what did the author have to write? He did all this research. He's bringing me this whole new world of history, and I'm learning it. Mm -hmm. No, you're saying, I want to learn this, but I don't want to learn that. Yeah. So what, that's the other, you know, so not only is math destroying the continuity of thinking, now I'm seeing it in language and in history, um, in reading skills. We don't diagram sen sentences and really talk about the flow of verbs and nouns. They talk about the ideas. Mm -hmm. Or you may dwell on one vocabulary word. This word is courage. Let's talk about all the animals and draw pictures of animals with courage. So now you spend the rest of English time right. drawing the word courage in all the different formats. And That's great. Rainbow colors and... Yeah, well one thing, one thing the nuns taught us that was I thought really good was chronological order of history. That's we would go cool. up and down the aisles and um, they would say, okay, uh, Declaration of Independence, and the right answer is uh -huh. 1776, you know, and uh -huh. you would say, um, okay, uh, Columbus sailed over the ocean blue, 1492. Uh -huh. uh, but that way you kind of knew what was going on, not only in uh, Western civilization, but maybe other places around the world, too. If you, if you uh, thought about um, uh, 1492, well, what else is going on? Well, Ferdinand and Isabella had just driven the Moors out of Spain, uh -huh. and uh, Christopher Columbus was um, Italian, but then... You get into well, then he killed a bunch of Indians, you know, in the Caribbean, and it, it kind of. I mean, but you have to have that basis first. Like if I write out a check, you know, I don't you don't write out any checks anymore. But if it comes to seventeen dollars and seventy six cents, I would always just to show my knowledge, I would tell the the person checking, yeah, oh, that's your um, the Declaration of Independence uh -huh. was was written. It's sort of like trivia. I love trivia uh -huh. and all that. But um, but math, you know, well, I, I'm not saying I was that. You know, I was good at arithmetic, but uh, I could do some of the higher math, like uh, long division. And my two sons are engineers now. Uh -huh. And so I've watched them do their homework, and one of their college professors said, pretend you don't have a computer, and you're going to develop a program to the strength of a bridge. You know, mm -hmm. and you're going you're to write the program. And I thought that was a good activity, but he had the skills to do that. He did go through private school. Um, I don't see that kids this, these days have that ability anymore to do the higher level math, to do the algebra, even the simple algebra problems and matrices and things. They don't have the skills to do that, but that also leads to another set of skills, which is to build the bridge, to do the road, to build the house that's not going to fall. Well, I would say, though, um, for what I did in life, and now I'm retired, uh, everything I needed to know I learned mostly from my parents or uh, on my own or on the job. I went, you know, I finally finished college, but it, 
really had taught me a lot of stuff I didn't ever need. And a lot of that's because you had something called fundamentals. You learn your addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in grade school. Right. And so you had that pounded into you. Mm -hmm. But that's why then, as you got older, then you had the ability to just explore whatever you wanted to be. You know, to, to go with it. I like history. I don't like this. And you moved down that course. What I'm seeing nowadays is those fundamentals are not being created. There are school districts that don't allow flashcards. That they don't go over and over and do that repetition. And what do you think that? Do you think it's some malevolent force? It's what, what do you attribute this? Is it globalism or um, part uh, of it is just the educrats? You know, yeah. go, it's and maybe in their sincerity that they believe a new philosophy that the children will learn more when they develop their own set of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you have all this knowledge put into the child. You allow the child to come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. But it's to the extent now where I had a mom talk to me about their fourth grade child, and he didn't know how to do the math problem, which is probably pretty basic, but he just didn't know. And the teacher wouldn't tell him. Instead, the teacher said, no, you try it out. You explore. You, did, you know, figure it out on your own. But the kid mm -hmm. couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't finishing his work at school, and the mom said to him, you know, no, you know, you can't watch TV, you can't do, you know, play video games. And which the mom, when I told the mom this concept called constructivism, where the children construct their own knowledge and construct their own methodology, that this teacher might be a constructivist teacher. Mm -hmm. The mom did talk to the teacher, found out that was the case, and then sat down with the little boy and, you know, had to teach the child herself. Well, I could understand like a lower uh, ratio of teachers to students in the primary grades because that's more one-on-one, -on -one, you're um, teaching fundamentals. But once you get, say, past even sixth grade, uh, can they? Can you watch a video and learn the same thing you would from a, well, you still a professor? Need, well, you still need, but, but again, you still need someone standing in front of the room saying, you, li you know, long division, you line it up here, you line it here, you take this number and you do this. Right. Instead, what they do with division is if you're going to divide 52 by 5, instead of thinking in terms of the number 52, you think in terms of 50 and 2, mm -hmm. or 10 groups of 5. So now you've got a mental image of a picture. I've got 10 groups of 5, and then I've got two lone ones over here, and now I'm going to take this 5 here, and I'm going to... So it, it's more of a visual. Now, that mm -hmm. could be okay when you're teaching long division to a third grader or a fourth grader to help them understand the process. But at some point, you have to take them and just say, here's the number sentence. Here's how you line it up. Because if you don't do that, you can't do algebra. Mm -hmm. You can't go into that higher level math. What we're seeing is that the children never make that change from just understanding that 52 is a number on its own. Instead, they're still thinking five groups of 10. And mm -hmm. that's what Common Core has done. They call decomposing and recomposing numbers. Mm -hmm. You take every number and you break it down. You manipulate the numbers down here, and then you add it all up up here. It, you can get to a correct answer, but you can also mess up in all the different formulations. that like you multiplication 16 times 32. You write the number 32 down 16 times. Mm -hmm. That works, but what if you add wrong? Yeah. You still get an A because you understood the process. Mm -hmm. Even though he had the absolute wrong answer, well, I that's thought, the kind of thing. I, I thought, uh, like in high school, especially civics and mm -hmm. history were important subjects. But usually, they would have a coach, you know, who was trying to justify. His, you know, his, his main thing was coaching whatever sport it was. But right. then they would have him teaching civics or history, mm -hmm. and he would, you know, wasn't really in depth or. Uh, and it's very important if you're going to vote, which actually <clears throat> that you have a, right. a knowledge. So I always say, get out the vote, but get out the informed vote. And there's kind of like a thin slice of people that actually understand what they're even voting about. And, and what happens in civics class, and I've even seen this as young as second and third grade, is that your civics class becomes a protest class. Find yeah. a cause. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, you want this tree, you don't want the tree <clears throat> in the park to be cut down and your city mm -hmm. wants to cut it down. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And so they're actually teaching activism so that the word civics in today's public school teaching is not the kind of civics that you're thinking where it's about learning your rights to vote. Mm -hmm. It's learning to write your rights to vote as well as learning how to protest. And so you find your cause. Find a cause in your neighborhood and make a difference. And so it sounds benign, 
but what they're actually doing is coaching the children to defy authority and to then find a cause. Usually the suggested causes all lean on what we would call the liberal progressive side, mm -hmm. the global warming side, um, the, and their role models are all, all people from the past that have been known to be protesters, you know, Chavez and just all, all that. As opposed was, to the protesters that were called our founding fathers. Correct. Yeah. Well, the, no, mm -hmm. the, the, they were white men, Yeah. and they don't count anymore. Uh -huh. But I think there are, uh, you don't dare, your walk on eggshells when you talk about this, but um, it seems to me, uh, anecdotally, from my experience, that Asians were a lot better geared towards math and those technical things, mm -hmm. and um, that's how the kids were. And, and I do. What, and why do you think lot. that is? If that, if you agree with that. Um, I, I, growing up in Tokyo, Japan, mm -hmm. I have to say I did know some Asians that were not smart. Yeah. You, know, you're, you have this whole country right. there. I would say that one thing that Asians did have that other folks did not have was called Asian mommies or tiger mommies. Oh. Okay. And so it was that that sense that my kid's going to do well and the children felt that sense that I need to do the work because mommy told me to and mommy wouldn't let me do anything. It's probably that value system, mm -hmm. that ethic, work ethic, that's, that, that probably overrides why Asians appear to do better than others. And maybe stronger than, families. It's not, yeah. it's not a DNA thing. Right. You know? uh-huh. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like a, uh, there's always exceptions all across mm -hmm. everything, but I would say you know, statistically, maybe that might be true. Like when I would go into the library when I was mm -hmm. in college, it would be, um, you know, maybe Asians were 10% of our student body, but it was mostly mm -hmm. Asians that were in there studying mm -hmm. after. I had a lot of more Vietnamese too. I think they, uh, a lot of people that come from other countries, they do better than the ones that are have been here and mm -hmm. raised here. They who have become complacent, you know. I mean, right. we're, we've, from childhood, we've enjoyed their, uh, riches of this this wealthy mm -hmm. nation, but other ones they come here and they have a chance. Hey, this is my opportunity. They're not asking for anything. Mm -hmm. They just they work harder, and then there's that they form those habits and they're more successful. Mm -hmm. But then I think, like they say, um, you know, eventually, say the first generation of that came over as boat people. You know, mm -hmm. they well they made the sacrifices. So if their children go to school and they became professionals, doctors and um, mm -hmm. uh, engineers. But then their kids now are starting it. It's like entropy, right. you know. Yes. And yeah, I think exactly. maybe the same thing is true in Japan too, isn't it? Right. And, yeah. and I, I would say that that would be with any generation. With okay. Coming over here. And... So it's always, but uh, now there's this uh, bill R88. Right. I think. Can you tell us about that? Now the reform 88, which is to overturn. Initiative I-1000. Okay. The idea is that I, there was in the past, um, in the 1990s, that there was a law passed as an initiative that said that you, are, are, you will reward people based upon their merit, based upon their experience, and that was one thing. In other words, you cannot just have hiring practices based on the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. The legislature had in front of them I-1000, Initiative 1000, which got the signatures, that said, you're going to go back to the practice of giving preferences just because of the color of your skin. Of quotas. Of, it, it, it is quoted. They claim yeah. it's not quotas, yet in the testimony they said, we're going to guarantee that we have five slots in this class and three of them are going to go to uh, uh, someone who is of the right race, of the right disability, of the right tr uh, sexual orientation, because mm -hmm. those are three of the categories they now, they now put into place. Um, that is a quota. No mm -hmm. matter how you you know right. paint it, it's a quota system. Mm -hmm. The it, and interesting and a quota, as I see it, is reverse discrimination. It is. It's it's legalizing discrimination, uh -huh. and the Asian community in Seattle rose up against this because what they found out is that because Asians seem to be overrepresented in colleges and in the workforce, mm -hmm. they were considered white. In fact, some Asians were told, "Oh, you're just white," hmm. so they knew that they would be at the bottom of the ladder. Mm -hmm. and that their children then would not be able to get into schools even though they had the highest SAT scores. Mm -hmm. And so getting into schools is no longer a merit. What we're also finding in places where they do have this kind of law, you may have a classroom of 30 seats and you have five seats that are vacant and you have 
uh, other folks that are qualified with their, you know, SAT scores and their essays and everything to get into that class, but they just have to be the wrong color of skin, meaning that they're either white or they're Asian. And mm -hmm. they're looking at the five empty seats saying, I want that seat. Mm -hmm. But the administration is saying, no, we have to hold open in case that one extra black person signs up for this higher level engineering class. Mm -hmm. So then, the, again, you get cut out of the process instead of rewarding a merit. Right. So the referendum 88 was a initiative, like a law, that got passed on the very last day of session. And because it was passed, it, there was a chance to overturn it by using the referendum process. Mm -hmm. That got the signatures, so you may have been part of the signing the signatures and getting that in. Once the signatures got in, what it essentially effectively did was put I-1000 back on the ballot. So this November, what you're going to see is Referendum 88 to overturn I-1000. Do you approve or do you reject? If you don't want to legalize discrimination, if you don't want quota systems, then you have to say reject 88. If you, and that way you can actually bring back folks to come in on their merit the other thing it does is affects business owners. So if you are a business owner and you have a small business, but you do window washing, you do you know power washing for the city hall, then you're going to be affected by this. Mm -hmm. And that means that your business, of which you had a family business, you hired all your friends and relatives, and you know that that you know uh, your cousin's son is now growing up and he's just ripe to join your company, but because you do power washing for the city hall, you have to consider to hire someone from the right race category, the sexual orientation, the gender, the age, the disability mm -hmm. first, before you can just go ahead and hire your friend. Well, a lot of these uh, initiatives and referendums, when you read them, you're kind of confused by how they're right. written. So, but we do need to reject. Reject. R88, reject, reject, reject. If you, if you agree with uh, Sharon and right. myself too. And, and then the other thing that we're finding in states that do have this kind of quota system you have a small business that's a contractor, and they have to fulfill that subcontractors with the right categories of people. So someone in that category can say, hey, I know I'm going to get this job. I don't have to worry about doing a low bid. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it ends up bumping up the cost of all the contracts. Mm -hmm. And of course, that cost gets, you know, goes up the ladder, and now you're buying your house, and you're saying, how come I'm paying $50,000 more for this house than I was two years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because the subcontractors had to be of the right color, the right uh, gender, the right you know, um, veterans policy or something, and that they know that, so they didn't go for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we had to take them anyway. Okay. Now, um, what's happening January 15th? In January 15th, so one of the things I've done is go to Olympia, become an, a mother that turned activist. I believe every mom and dad, every family can do that. And one of the things to show force in Olympia is to show up. And just like that one senator told me, you have to get more guys on your side than they have on theirs. Mm -hmm. So on January 15th, there will be a rally in Olympia. What day and is it on? It's on a Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. it's a Wednesday all-day event. Mm -hmm. We want you to come and show up, and we also want you to provide letters to your legislators, you know, items to drop off to your legislators, your two, two representatives and your one senator. So it's not just a rally. It's a chance to go into the offices of your leaders mm -hmm. and drop them off a little gift or present that we will be telling you more by going to My Family, My Choice, at myfamilymychoice.org or emailing myfamilymychoice at yahoo.com for more information and periodically check that website after the November election this year we'll be posting more information about that day but we want everyone to join us in Olympia because the only way we can show force is to show up and show up in large numbers and what website is that? myfamilymychoice.org okay and I think you know if you don't show up um, uh, then I think well, legislators think, well, it doesn't matter that much. But if you do show up, oh, maybe there is something. Yes. And um, and whatever your cause. Right. Which uh, what you know whether your cause is the the immunization, the discrimination. If your cause is high taxes, yeah. we want you to all show up, and we are networking with other folks to try to get more folks to come that day. Right. And uh, you know, sex education. Mm -hmm. If you d are not happy with what's going on, then you need to show up. Also, this particular legislator last year was evidence that for the first time in a long time, the Republicans do not own 
any member of the House, they don't control the House or the Senate. Mm -hmm. It's a party line thing, but it actually has shown a difference because many of the bad bills that were passed last year were passed on party lines. Right. Again, this year, what we're going to see is that the Democrat Party are wanting to do an income tax. They're wanting to do more controls over family values, more controls over your health of your child. And so by showing up, maybe <clears throat> we can let them know we are organizing, we are watching you, we want we want you to pay attention to us. The legislature, the makeup of it now is pretty much anti-freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's and why getting we call worse. the 2020 Freedom Rally uh -huh. on January 15th, 2020. It's a Wednesday on uh -huh. the Capitol steps. Okay, I know it's, it's for Eastern Washington people. It's kind of difficult to get over there, but, you know, it's, if we just go at least one day, and then it's, it could be a lot of fun too. I love going to Olympia, and the oh, weather will be better over there right. probably. And you know, if it's cold over here, it's probably not nearly as cold mm -hmm. over there. Yeah. Bring Get your umbrella yeah. uh, if you can. But it's fun to try to see as many legislators in as short a time possible mm -hmm. as you, you can. The civic process of that is you learn a lot. Right. And then, but it also has a a good effect. I mean, we need to do this not just you know for mm -hmm. ourselves, but uh, for our children too. We have a duty, I think, to give a better world to our children than the one we were born into, not a worse one. Right, and it's like the frog that was in the, the boiling water. Right. Uh -huh. The temperature is coming, we're boiled now. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, it, and we got there because we were not paying attention or we allowed, the, and part of it is we trusted too much. Mm -hmm. We trusted things and we have to understand that we have wonderful teachers and the wonderful principals in our school systems. Mm -hmm. What they have though is they have top-down laws from the Office of Superintendent, mm -hmm. from the federal government, that's forcing them into teaching ways and methods, teaching things that they may not have otherwise really want to, but they're caught in that. And so, in a way, they're victims as well. The teachers are the victims. So, mm -hmm. this is nothing about bad teachers. This is all about bad policies. Mm -hmm. And the policies are, are coming down onto the teachers. They're not the one creating the policies. So we want to help our teachers mm -hmm. by saying we support the good teachers right. and we want you to show up and say we don't want this kind of, let's say, sex education mm -hmm. taught this way. Um, sex education, they want a one-size-fits-all mandate. So whether you are inner city Seattle or you're out there in Ponderay County, mm -hmm. then you're going to teach sex ed the same way. Right. We have different value systems, different communities. Mm -hmm. We need to honor the uniqueness of each community. And that's one of the things that we were fighting for last session. We stalled the law, but it will be back. Mm -hmm. Our leaders want to ma mandate a one-size-fits-all curriculum on every school district across our state. Okay, well, let's all try to join Sharon Hanna January 15th. Uh, it's a Wednesday in uh, Olympia. And show our legislators that we actually care how they vote. So uh, thank you for being our guest today, well, Sharon. Thank you for having me here. Okay, this has been uh, Cutting to the Chase, and let's not forget to pray first. This has been Cut to the Chase with Rob Chase, where we cover anything under the sun that would be of interest to you, our viewers. Cut to the Chase has been brought to you by the InlandNorthwestReport.com, alternative news and opinion for the Inland Northwest. Don't forget to catch the Sunday edition of Cut to the Chase, where Rob interviews local pastors on Christian perspectives. Until next time, stay in prayer for God family and country.